Uh, sweet child, come here. How old are you? Well, I'm really only 18, but I always admit to 20 when I go to evening parties. You are perfectly right in making some slight alteration. Indeed, no woman should ever be quite accurate about her age. It looks so calculating. 18, but admitting to 20 at evening parties. Well, it will not be very long before you are of age and free from the restraints of tutelage. So I don't think your guardian's consent is, after all, a matter of any importance. Pray excuse me for interrupting you again, Lady Brett. But I think it's only fair to tell you that according to the terms of her grandfather's will, Miss Cardew does not come legally of age till she is 35. That does not seem to me to be a grave objection. 35 is a very attractive age. London society is full of women of the very highest birth who have of their own free choice remained 35 for years. Lady Dumbleton is an instance in point. To my own knowledge, she has been 35 ever since she arrived at the age of 40, which is many years ago now. I see no reason why our dear Cecily should not be even still more attractive at the age you mention than she is at present. There will be a large accumulation of property. Algie, could you wait for me till I was 35? Of course I could, Cecily. You know I could. Yes, I felt it instinctively. But I couldn't wait all that time. I hate waiting even five minutes for anybody. It always makes me rather cross. I'm not punctual myself, I know. But I do like punctuality in others. And waiting, even to be married, is quite out of the question. Then what is to be done, Cecily? I don't know, Mr Moncrief. My dear Mr. Worthing, as Miss Cardew states positively that she cannot wait until she is 35, a remark which I'm bound to say seems to me to show a somewhat impatient nature, I would beg of you to reconsider your decision. But, my dear Lady Bracknell, the matter is entirely in your own hands. The moment you consent to my marriage to Gwendolyn, I will most gladly allow your nephew to form an alliance with my ward. You must be quite aware, sir, that what you propose is out of the question. Then a passionate celibacy is all that any of us can look forward to. That is not the destiny I propose for Gwendolyn. Algernon, of course, can choose for himself. Come, dear. We have already missed five, if not six, trains. To miss any more might expose us to comment on the platform. Everything is quite ready for the christenings. The christenings, sir? Is that not somewhat premature? Both these gentlemen have expressed a desire for immediate baptism. At their age? The idea is grotesque and irreligious. Algernon, I forbid you to be baptised. I will not hear of such excesses. Lord Bracknell would be highly displeased if he learned that that was the way in which you wasted your time and money. Am I to understand, then, that there are to be no christenings at all this afternoon? I don't think that, as things are now, it would be of much practical value to either of us, Dr. Chasuble. I am grieved to hear such sentiments from you, Mr. Worthing. They savour of the heretical views of the Anabaptists, views that I have completely refuted in four of my unpublished sermons. However, as your present mood seems to be one peculiarly secular, I will return to the church. Indeed, I have just been informed by the pew opener that for the last hour and a half, Miss Prism has been waiting for me in the vestry. Miss Prism? Did I hear you mention a Miss Prism? Yes, Lady Bracknell, I'm on my way to join her. Pray allow me to detain you for a moment. This matter may prove to be one of vital importance to Lord Bracknell and myself. Is this Miss Prism a female of repellent aspect, remotely connected with education. She is the most cultivated of ladies and the very picture of respectability. It is obviously the same person. May I ask what position she holds in your household? I am a celibate, madam. Miss Prism, Lady Bracknell, has been for the last three years Miss Cardew's esteemed governess and valued companion. In spite of what I hear of her, I must see her at once. Let her be sent for. She approaches. She is nigh. I was told you expected me in the vestry, dear Canon. I've been waiting for you there for an hour and three quarters. Prism. Come here, Prism. Prism. Where is that baby? Twenty-eight years ago, Prism, you left Lord Bracknell's house 
number 104 Grosvenor Square, in charge of a perambulator that contained a baby of the male sex. You never returned. A few weeks later, through the elaborate investigations of the Metropolitan Police, the perambulator was discovered at midnight, standing by itself in a remote corner of Bayswater. It contained the manuscript of a three-volume novel of more than usually revolting sentimentality. But the baby was not there. Prism, where is that baby? Lady Bracknell, I admit with shame that I do not know. I only wish I did. The plain facts of the case are these. On the morning of the day you mention, a day that is forever branded on my memory, I prepared, as usual, to take the baby out in its perambulator. I had also with me a somewhat old but capacious handbag in which I had intended to place the manuscript of a work of fiction that I had written during my few unoccupied hours. In a moment of mental abstraction for which I never can forgive myself, I deposited the manuscript in the bassinet and placed the baby in the handbag. Where did you deposit the handbag? Do not ask me, Mr. Worthing. Miss Prism, this is a matter of no small importance to me. I insist on knowing where you deposited the handbag that contained that infant. I left it in the cloakroom of one of the larger railway stations in London. What railway station? Victoria. The Brighton Line. I must retire to my room for a moment. Wendelin, wait here for me. If you are not too long, I will wait for you all my life. What do you think this means, Lady Bracknell? I dare not even suspect, Dr. Treasurable. I need hardly tell you that in families of high position, strange coincidences are not supposed to occur. They are hardly considered the thing. Uncle Jack seems strangely agitated. Your guardian has a very emotional nature. This noise is extremely unpleasant. It sounds as if he was having an argument. I dislike arguments of any kind. They're always vulgar and often convincing. It has stopped now. I wish he would arrive at some conclusion. This suspense is terrible. I hope it will last. Is this the bag, Miss Prism? Examine it carefully before you speak. The happiness of more than one life depends on your answer. It seems to be mine. Yes. Here is the injury it received through the upsetting of a Gower Street omnibus in younger and happier days. Here is the stain on the lining caused by the explosion of a temperance beverage, an incident that occurred at Leamington. Here on the lock are my initials. I'd forgotten that in an extravagant mood I had them placed there. Oh, the bag is undoubtedly mine. I am delighted to have it so unexpectedly restored to me. It's been a great inconvenience being without it all these years. This prison. More to you is restored than this handbag. I was the baby you placed in it. You? Yes. Oh, Mother. Mr. Worthing, I am unmarried. Unmarried? I do not deny that is a serious blow. But after all, who has the right to cast a stone against one who has suffered? Cannot repentance wipe out an act of folly? Why should there be one law for men and one for women? Mother, I forgive you. Mr. Worthing, there is some error. There is the lady who can tell you who you really are. Lady Bracknell, I hate to seem inquisitive, but would you kindly inform me who I am? I am afraid the news I have to give you will not altogether please you. You are the son of my poor sister, Mrs. Moncrief, and consequently, Algernon's elder brother. Algernon's elder brother? Algernon's elder brother? Then I have a brother after all. 
I always said I had a brother. I knew I had a brother. Cecily, how could you have doubted I had a brother? Dr. Chasuble, my unfortunate brother. Miss Prism, my unfortunate brother. Gwendolyn, my unfortunate brother. Algie, you will have to treat me with more respect in the future. You've never behaved to me like a brother in all your life. Well, not today, old boy, I admit. However, I did my best, though I was out of practice. My own? But what own are you? What is your Christian name now that you have become someone else? Oh, God. I'd quite forgotten that point. Your decision on the subject of my name is irrevocable, I suppose. I never change except in my affections. What a noble nature you have, Gwendolyn. Then the question had better be cleared up at once. Aunt Augusta. A moment. At the time when Miss Prism left me in the handbag, had I been christened already? Every luxury that money could buy, including christening, had been lavished on you by your fond and doting parents. <laughs> then I had been christened. That is settled now. What name was I given? Let me know the worst. Being the eldest son, you were naturally christened after your father. Yes. What was my father's Christian name? I cannot at the moment recall what the General's Christian name was. I have no doubt he had one. Uh, he was eccentric, I admit, but only in later years. And that was the result of the Indian climate and marriage and indigestion and other things of that kind. Algy, can't you recollect what our father's Christian name was? My dear boy, we weren't even on speaking terms. He died before I was a year old. Miss... His name would appear in the army lists of the period, I suppose, Aunt Augusta. Uh, the general was essentially a man of peace, except in his domestic life. But I have no doubt his name would appear in any military directory. The army lists of the last 40 years are here. These delightful records should have been my constant study. Um, generals, Mallon, Max Bowman, Magley. What ghastly names they have. Mark B. Mixby, Mobs, Moncrief, Lieutenant, 1840. Captain, Lieutenant Colonel, Colonel, General, 1869. Christian names, Ernest, John. <gasps> I always told you, Gwendolyn, my name is Ernest, didn't I? Well, it is Ernest after all. I mean, it naturally is Ernest. I remember now that the general was called Ernest. I knew I had some particular reason for disliking the name. Ernest, my own Ernest. I felt from the first you could have no other name. It is a terrible thing for a man to find out suddenly that all his life he's been speaking nothing but the truth. Can you ever forgive me? I can, for I feel that you are sure to change. Oh, my own man. I have come to the conclusion that the primitive church was in error on certain points. Miss Prism... Letitia, I beg to solicit the honour of your hand. Frederick, at last. Cecily, at last. Gwendolen, at last. My nephew? You seem to be displaying signs of triviality. On the contrary, Aunt Augusta. I have now realised for the first time in my life the vital importance of being earnest. Thank you.